Okay, so we have some, um, well, I don't use this word uh, easily. We have some incredible people who've come to speak to you today. They are um, devoted to the cause of education in the service of remembrance and in human rights. Jack Weinstein is the director of the Northern California Office of Facing History and Ourselves, which was started in Boston. Um, how many years ago? 1976. 1976. Um, they started out as a, an organization talking about the Holocaust, and they now talk uh, very broadly, not only about the Holocaust, but about human rights violations all over, and um, encouraging teachers to learn how to pass on values that students in schools can use to um, shape their characters so that they never become bystanders but become upstanders. Uh, Jack has an MA in English from Cal State Hayward as well as his bachelor and uh, he's taught English and social studies both in Berkeley and at Malpitas High. Um, our second incredible person is Morgan Blum. Um, I've known both of these people quite a while. Morgan is the director of education for the Holocaust Center that's now uh, associated with the Jewish Family and Children's Service. Uh, she has a very, very wide background on presenting information to teachers, to students, and to adults on subjects uh, that pertain to the Holocaust. Um, she has a bachelor's degree from Clark University and her master's in Holocaust studies from Deakin University in Australia. Um, I'd like you to welcome Morgan and Jack and give them your full attention. All right. Get the applause out of the way up front. That's good. Because you don't know what you're going to feel in 90 minutes. Um, very nice to be here at Sonoma State. Morgan and I have talked about this for a while since the invitation came in uh, from Myrna some months ago about what we could most logically share with you in a short period of time. And we came down to three pretty essential questions that I think it's fair for us to address together. And we'll try to do this in a way that um, isn't a block. We're not, I'm not going to do 45 minutes and then turn it over to Morgan to do 45 minutes. We're going we're to do this in tandem. So you hear both voices and get both the range of information from both organizations throughout the session. And what we'll try to do is address some pretty simple questions right off the bat. One is, you're sort of a captive audience. It's only fair for you to know a little bit and maybe a tiny bit more than what Myrna has shared about who we are and about uh, how that relates to the organizations that we represent. Um, I think that, that stories that go away from the human aspect are, you know, I think it's a mistake to talk about life and death with people without their knowing something about who you are and what brought you in to those conversations. So uh, this is sort of an emblematic way of doing what we do and what she does with teachers and with students when we do this longer term, not just in one short session. We start with ourselves because in the end we wanted to come back to ourselves as a way of saying who are we and why are we who we are and does knowing this information about this history somehow make us different than what we might have been without this information. I think that's a fair way of thinking about Holocaust and human behavior. And I think it's a fair way of thinking about why your educations should include something about the Holocaust and many other atrocities in the history of the world, including current ones. We also so, want to hear yeah, your please. voice. We want there will be times throughout our our talk today, and I think Jack and I are most comfortable in teaching workshops. So we really see this as a workshop and not as a lecture because as important as our voices are, we want to hear your voice. So there'll be different times we'll designate to hear your voice, but at any time, raise your hand, stand up. If you feel inspired, add your voice to the conversation. We'd love to hear it. Correct. 
So the first piece that we're going to do is a little bit about our respective organizations and how we came to them. Uh, because that's our story, that's our human story. And if, um, if you're as smart as I'm told you are, you'll make the connections to why you may have come to this class and what brought you to this, this class and what you'll do with it when you leave uh, armed with maybe either new knowledge or having been reintroduced to some important ideas. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and start, right? Go for it. All right. So Facing History and Ourselves began, as Myrna said, uh, with a little prompting from me way back in the 1970s. And a little bit of the historical background of the organization uh, can be instructive. So I'll just give you a minute or two about it. The founder of Facing History is a woman a little bit older than I am. And she, she grew up in Memphis, Tennessee. Her name is Margot Strong. And she was a uh, child of one of very few uh, Jewish parents uh, living in, uh, in a certain area of Memphis where she grew up. And uh, so by virtue of her religious background, her cultural background, she was a visitor in a sense in a white community in Memphis. And she remembers as a child being driven on a bus to school and being driven by the, uh, the, the zoo, the Memphis Zoo. And she remembers looking out the window and seeing a sign uh, when she was in junior high school, for example, that said, Colored Day on Thursday. And she really didn't understand what that meant. And of course it meant that that was the day that African American uh, Memphians could go to the zoo. And she remembers going to an American history class in eighth grade and never really talking about things like that sign. She remembers earlier than that, and she tells this story when she talks about how Facing History came to be. She remembers going to a department store with her grandmother and seeing the signs next to water fountains in the 1950s. It said, colored, wa you know, colored water fountains. And she wondered when she saw the water spouting out why it was regular water and not colored water. And she had to be told which water fountain to use. But she never remembers having conversations in school about those disparities in life, about those things that were so unfair in the world. And she felt as a young child that the educational system had really betrayed her by not giving her an opportunity to discuss those kinds of ideas. As a young person, she, she understood that that was a real mistake. And as she got older and she became a teacher herself, uh, living first in Chicago and then in Boston, and in Boston in the 1970s, during the time of desegregation, when she could look out her window in Boston and see the buses being rocked because people didn't want uh, desegregation or integration to occur. And she doesn't remember there being any real part of the curriculum then either. So 20 years after a childhood had unfolded with teachers being silent, she witnessed silence again, but this time it was as a teacher. And that was the genesis of Facing History. Not that it was all about the history of race in America, although it, it was about that. Not that it was only about Holocaust studies, though it was about that. But what it was about, what was the genesis of Facing History, was to tell the untold stories. And to reach the ears that had never heard those stories as part of their daily lives in schools of all places. Which should be the safest spaces to practice democracy that we have in this society. So that, I'm going to leap forward because that just gives you a sense of the energy that informed the beginnings of Facing History. And I'll tell you that as a young teacher uh, in the 1970s, in the late 1970s when I began my career, I was bent on the idea that we should give children opportunities to do three things. One, to come into contact with really difficult contact, content. In other words, it's the stuff that we hear about in the newspapers today. Kids don't know enough, kids don't study enough, kids don't pass tests enough, God help us. But that's what we are, uh, are told. It's a mantra from the media all the time. And that's one. Content matters. To do the heavy lifting in life, you do have to know something. And it's stuff that you could be tested on. And so that counts in what we do as teachers. What also counts with what we do as teachers is that young people have a right to explore the emotional connections that could exist between what they're learning and the lives they're living. Why it matters. Why it's moving to them. Why, how it colors the way they look at their lives. How it colors the way they take on new tasks. 
And that emotional engagement needs to be written about and talked about and shared and thought about and woven into the curriculum as much but alongside that deep content. Because that deep content alone produced educated Eichmanns. The majority of people who led the Third Reich were well educated in the formal sense of the term. They could not only read and write, but they could do advanced math. And that's wonderful that they could do advanced math. Too bad they used advanced math to figure out the trajectory for bombs, to learn how to build V2 rockets, and to figure out labor equations within concentration camps. Too bad that that was the case. What's education without a conscience? What's education without the emotional engagement of young people? Asking themselves, what does this mean about me as a human being? And the third thing that we, at Facing History, through Margot's leadership well before I came into the mix, was that there's an ethical imperative connected to learning. In other words, once you, you've been given a body of knowledge, important content, and once you've considered how it connects to your heart as well as your head, then you've got to figure out what to do with your hands, what to do with your feet, what to do with your deeds, what to do with your words, what to do with the way you live in the world. And so that piece of it is the ethical imperative. And one without the other doesn't work. You th I think of it as a wild triangle. And any one of those three things could be at the very top at any given time. You could turn that triangle round and round in terms of a priority. Sometimes it's the emotional connection that's most important. Sometimes it's the ethical imperative that's most important. And sometimes it's the content that's most important. And sometimes one can't exist without the other. So Facing History has taken that on. And in our work at Facing History, and that's what brought me to it. So for 30 years I've labored in the field, and or now as part of an organization called Facing History, to bring those skill sets and that content and that opportunity to young people through their teachers. And that's the goal of our work. Uh, we are tied at the hip to what Morgan does at the Holocaust Center through the uh, Jewish Family and Children's Service. She'll tell you about the work she does. You'll understand why we have to work together. No turf issues allowed. Two organizations, each having to raise money to do its work, each having to spread their message, you know, each having to be apostles of good, we hope, each having to make ties to other informational outlets, each having to work with schools. Very easy to fall into silos and say, oh, we're not them and they're not us. We don't do that. Between the, the two organizations alone, not to mention so many others, there's so much work to be done, we'll never be done with it. There could be another 10 of our organizations, and we'd still never be done with it. So what we have to do is learn to work together. And as you hear her talk about the organization she directs, you'll understand why this is so important and why what you've seen on the website makes sense. Our reach is, as Myrna described it, to walk that line between what's particular about the content of this history and what's universal about it. And not to fall over one into the other. Not to make easy comparisons, because that cheapens the equation. The Hitler Youth is not the same as bullying that you see on 60 Minutes. They're different. They're fundamentally different. But if you want to get a sense of identity and the power of labels, you might be able to use either side of that equation to plumb the human questions that come up, whether it's on the schoolyard, right here in your city, or back in time on another continent. And not to be afraid to do that as long as we're armed with the knowledge about the distinctions between those two things, as well as the similarities between them. And that's what we do at Facing History. That's my job. The staff of six in the Bay Area, staff of 150 nationally, a reach to about 25,000 teachers in the United States, uh, so far, about 300 schools in the Bay Area and uh, that employ our program. And I'm very proud to say that all of that began uh, in the, on the West Coast in my garage. So too bad it shouldn't have been Hewlett Packard, but um, it began in my garage with a single class, my own. And through the hard work of so many other people, we're now, touched, we're now in touch with uh, about 2,500 teachers in the Bay Area trying to do this good work. So with that in mind, let me introduce Morgan Blum. She's going to tell you a little bit about uh, the way we interact with their organization and what they do, and then we'll move on from there. Thanks, Jack. 
I would say Jack and I get to share a lot of ideas, and actually we do our best work sitting over Armenian lunch True. at <laughs> La Med, most often in Oakland, sometimes in the other locations. You'll see Jack and I both come from a Jewish heritage, but we really appreciate good Armenian cuisine. And I would say my feedback on that is that you should think apple, not Hubert Packer. You should have been So, um, thank you, Jack and Myrna, and you guys all for being here on a lovely, beautiful, sunny day. I know it's the afternoon fatigue, but at times we'll keep you going. So, who remembers the first book they read about the Holocaust? Yeah, what was your book? Anne Frank. Anne Frank. Diary of Anne Frank. Great. Anyone else? Yeah. The Boy in the Striped Pajamas. The Boy in the Striped Pajamas. Anyone else? None of you have read any books about the Holocaust? What have you been in this class? The Hiding Place. The Hiding Place. Get in the back. Someone? Did anyone say hand? Yeah. Night. Night. Ellie Buzel. Anyone else? Here. Here. I live a thousand years. I live a thousand years. Anyone else? Yeah? No, I didn't see children's book. That's okay. The yellow star. The yellow star, right? Maybe the girl with the yellow star. Did anyone read Number of the Stars? <laughs> you guys read it? You guys read it? So that was the first book I ever read about the Holocaust. And I still, to this day, have Number of the Stars sitting on my bookshelf in my office. It often gets hidden behind all the papers piled up on my desk. But I was that kid that couldn't stop reading. I read Number of the Stars, and it continued on from there. My mom got a call when I was in fifth grade. I grew up in Marin, in Southern Marin. She gets a call from the school librarian that says, we've got a problem with Morgan. And, and, she, and she's like, what's wrong? She goes, she only checks out books on the Holocaust in the library. And there I was, a fifth grader that couldn't stop reading. So it continued on, and I continued to do all these weird research and, and study about Holocaust denial in seventh grade, and, and it continued on. And when I got into high school, I found this opportunity to join something called the March of the Living, where I first traveled to Poland, um, joined up with other youth and Holocaust survivors, and that was something that changed my life. As I went there, I saw, I witnessed the evidence of the Holocaust. I came back and I said, what do I do with this information? And I started teaching. So I went into seventh grade classrooms, I went into eighth grade classrooms, there I was a senior at high school with my slide projector. I know you guys probably don't even know what that is. It's these little funny cardboard things with pictures, <laughs> negatives in them. So I went with my slide projector all around the Bay Area. And I remember I was at a school called St. Hilary's, which is in Tiburon. And it was a seventh grade classroom. And I do my slideshow and I ask, is there any questions? And one kid raises his hand and he says, you know, my dad told me the Holocaust never happened, but now after seeing your slides and hearing your story, I know it did. And that kid, I don't even know his name, but he rides around in my back pocket. And when I am at my office till 8 o'clock at night trying to respond to emails, when I'm writing grants for fundraising, when I'm in challenging situations, all throughout the year, that kid is in my back pocket, just like Number of the Stars and just like that student. Those are the things that have inspired me over time. So continued on, and then I realized, wow, maybe one day I'll actually want to continue studying this more. I was also that kid that thought I knew everything there was to know about the Holocaust when I was in eighth grade, and then again in 12th grade. And I found out that there's actually a university where you can get your degree in Holocaust and Genocide Studies. How crazy is that? Now you have this amazing program at Sonoma State that didn't exist when I was in high school. So I went across the country to a small town called Worcester, Massachusetts where when you say you're from California, they think you're crazy. Why on earth would you go to central Massachusetts when you live, you're from the Bay Area? But it was there that I was in good company. And it was there that I met some of the best academics in the field. And it was there that I realized that Holocaust studies is not history. It is not Judaica studies. It is not German studies. It is not English. It is its own field, and it deserves the reputation. Not only that, but the, the other genocides as well. And it was at Clark that I started to get exposed to other genocides. I had a summer where I worked as an intern for an organization called the Anti-Defamation League in DC. And that year, the school year following back, I took my first course in the Armenian Genocide. And it was there that I was shocked. I just spent a summer training educators 
And there was not one word of the Armenian Genocide. And I went back to D.C. a few months later, and I walked into the director's office and I said, what's going on here? Why did we spend a summer teaching teachers and there is nothing on the Armenian Genocide in this curriculum? And he says, well, it's complicated, it's political, and we're a B'nai B'rith organization, and we support Israel, and Israel and Turkey, and you guys, I imagine, have studied a bit about the politics of the Armenian Genocide. And it was then again, like that kid, like number of the stars, like that kid in the seventh grade classroom, that I realized that change needed to happen in this world, and that it wasn't okay to spend a summer educating teachers and not talking about the Armenian Genocide. So I went back, I graduated, you guys all realize, you know, senior year in college, you get that inevitable question, what are you going to do after college when you graduate? It's kind of scary. Anyone getting that question right now? Yeah, yeah. it's like, what do you mean? <laughs> Why are you asking me those really difficult things? So I realized I had studied, in one of my classes, I had studied a, talking about indigenous genocide, and in particular talking about the case in Australia. Has anyone seen the movie Rabbit Proof Fence? Okay, good. All right. I'm in good company here. So this is before Rabbit Proof Fence really came out. And I read an article about that. The genocide can be committed not just through gas chambers, through killing fields, through death marches, but genocide can be committed through biological absorption. Genocide can be committed through forced procreation. Genocide can be committed through forced removal. Genocide can be committed in many different ways. All those other little subsets of the UN definition of genocide that we all know, that's often we don't pay attention, you know, C, D, and E. And it's important that those, those C, D, and E are actually talked about and they're recognized. Because what's the significant point, if we're talking about the UN definition, what's the significant catchphrase of genocide? Who knows? Never again. Never again, OK. But if we're actually looking at the UN definition of genocide, I'm going to call in a student first, if I can. <laughs> Have we talked about the UN definition of genocide? Of course. OK. So I'm not, I'm not speaking. OK, right here in the back. I'm sorry, I can't hear you. Speak. No, 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 I, I just couldn't hear you. I'm sorry, can anyone repeat what you thought I can hear? What's that? Not the right answer. Okay, does anyone feel like they want to? There's always not, right? Yeah, there's just different answers. Anyone have another? Yeah. It's to, it's to destroy and whole or part the people group of a certain culture. It's to be erased. Great. What was that word that comes before destroy and whole or in part? Does anyone know that one word? Starts so with an I, ends with a 10. <laughs> Intent, intent to destroy. So if that is the catchphrase if we're looking at the UN definition of genocide, and that was something that inspired me, is it's not how many people, it's not how they're killed, it's not where they're killed. If we're talking about if something is genocide or not, it's about the perpetrator's perspective of what their intention is and is their intention to destroy. And I was fascinated by that. So I crossed the Pacific, I went to Australia, I was the crazy Yankee who was knocking on doors and doing really progressive research there, and I decided to do my master's looking at the patterns of forced removal of genocide. Forced removal of children is a case of genocide. I looked at the case in Western Australia, similar to what you saw with the rabbit proof fence, and I did a cross-cultural comparison with Germany and North America. So through that, I found challenges, and I found different things. You've got to fight for what you believe in. There was people in a government that didn't believe, still to this day, that what they did to the Aboriginal children was wrong. And there's challenges, and you've got to stand up and fight for what you believe in, and that's what I learned. So continuing on the journey, I went the, the long way around the globe, spent some time in Europe, ended up back in San Francisco, and started working for an organization called the Holocaust Center of Northern California. So the Holocaust Center of Northern California does, um, does not exist anymore. It was started in 1979 by survivors. It was a very grassroots organization. There are some early members of HCMC here. Hans dates back much further than I do. And it was started with the intention to educate. There was a pro-Nazi bookstore that opened up in 1979 in San Francisco. And there was a survivor and his son who threw stones in the window and were very upset. And the whole kind of what came from that were three things. One, which were there should be a Holocaust memorial. Does anyone know where the Holocaust memorial is in San Francisco? 
Anyone seen it? Anyone heard of it? What is it? It's a sculpture. The sculpture, right. Do you know where it is? It is right outside one of the museums in Golden Gate Park. Right, close. It's Legion of Honor right at the yeah. end. Exactly. So there was a monument built. There was a national, there was a citywide commemoration of the Holocaust, which in Hebrew we say Yom HaShoah, which is actually this coming Sunday. And there was an institution that came out that should be an institution of ed education, research, and remembrance. So that's how our organization started. We chugged along for 30 years in the Bay Area from one basement to another of various different institutions throughout San Francisco. And I joined in, um, in September of 2005. So that's a little bit about the journey of the Holocaust Center. This past summer, I moved to be part of Jewish Family and Children's Services because as you guys know, what's happened with the economy? I know it's not an economics class, but what happens to small nonprofits in a challenging economy? It's tough. It's tough. So you've got to be fighters. Just like, you know, you've got to be fighters in different times, we realize what's the most realistic and responsible thing to, so we can continue to carry out our mission, and that is to join forces. With, an older, with, a, with a larger parent that can take us in. So we joined Jewish Family and Children's Services and it's a great home for us and we're under great leadership there. And not only as our small staff, we can tap into the great youth services and they provide survivor and senior services and there's their um, social service agencies. So there's a lot of different things that go on. If you went to jfcs.org, which maybe you did, you'll see there's a whole big ramification of things, and the Holocaust Center is one department of JFCS. So our mission has not changed, it's actually strengthened, and we're now with just a larger machine that's able to help us scream a little bit louder and fight in the world. So along that way, and I saved this the best for last, which was, has anyone done a summer internship before? No. I encourage you guys, if you haven't had a chance to do one, to do one, because they change things. So if you remember from my journey, I did a summer internship with the Anti-Defamation League, and that inspired me to make sure the Armenian Genocide was taught. And I also did a school year internship with an organization in Brookline, Massachusetts, in which this organization had me watching oral histories and cataloging them in their library. This organization had me calling survivors to find out how it was for them when they spoke in schools that week before. And this organization was facing history in ourselves. So in this world of Holocaust and Genocide Studies, it's a very small family. Mm -hmm. And it's great to be able to circle back and continue to work with one of the organizations that helped to shape my career. So I'm thrilled to be standing here next to Jack because... Even if she is taller than I am. Even though I am taller, <laughs> especially with my heels. But it's, it's a delight, and we continue to learn so much from each other. Thank you. And he even taught one of the courses that I continued to teach way back in the day. That's true. You can only partially blame me, though. <laughs> um, all right, so that, that it gives you a sense of who we are and what drives us. And we're going to put out another question to you, and this time you're going to have to help carry the ball. Um, it's doable. I know it's doable. I'm going to ask you some questions. And uh, you're going to have to speak from your own experience. And we're going to take, uh, we're going to be like we are in smaller classrooms. We're actually going to look to see where we can go. So don't get nervous. Just put it out when you have an opportunity. So I'm going to ask you a couple of things uh, right away. One of the things that happened for me when I first started with uh, this kind of education was that I wondered how we would ever tell if it worked. That's a fair question, isn't it? It's like the question that's being asked about schooling all over the country. How do we know when it works? When it's been done well, what would the results be? So here you are in a Holocaust speaker series. And it's probably not the only touch of the Holocaust educationally on your lives. But I think it's a fair question to ask to say, what are even some of the possible results? Dream big, small or big. Use what each of us has said before to help you sort of figure out what, what kind of little or big things might be the result of this education. So somebody goes and gets educated about the Holocaust. So what? What's the result of it? What do you think? Give me an example of something that could result from effective Holocaust education. In the back. 
Yeah. If somebody wants to further their education, they want to keep looking into it. They don't just stop there, they go out and try to research on their own. Great, so in independent research in addition to what they've learned in the classroom would be a sign that that education has worked to some degree. What else would be a sign that Holocaust education was successful? Yeah? Uh, there might be like some sort of policy that's um, not beneficial for a certain group of people, so they might take action in that and their communities or organizations. That's great, that's great. The idea that you might take action when you might not have without having been armed with this history. I think Holocaust education is among many different kinds of history that is meant to arm you to take action. So I think that is a logical idea, yeah. Um, it sparks and initiates conversation with people who aren't in the class, who weren't able to take it or might not know what you know, so it's like an exchange of information. So informal education results. It's about what happens around your dinner table yeah. or your dorm room or your coffee house experience or on your next Friday night date, right? <laughs> Seriously, all right? And of course, in my house, where I've been married now, it'll be 38 years in a few months. Uh, is that right? I think that's right, 30, 38 years. That's my sister over there, not my wife. Um, but um, 38 years, and sometimes when Karen and I go out for dinner with new friends, she sometimes stops me at the front door, and puts her hands on my shoulder, and turns me around and says, we're not gonna discuss genocide tonight. <laughs> Because sometimes we get a first date and that's all we get, you know, which is, it's fair, right? Because, you know, Morgan's not the only one who's sort of obsessed with this stuff, right? Uh, and you have to have a sense of humor and not let it sort of remove your intensity at the same time. I'm a fun guy. I am. You know, it says genocide's not fun. Genocide could be fun. Oh, gosh. Oh, goodness. Oh, goodness. Well, there you have gallows humor. So, um... So let's see, let's get a few more. What, what else does effective Holocaust education look like? Yeah? You may not see it because I think you're planting seeds with people and that maybe the next time some, a student overhears some racist comment or some abusive thing, they'll, they might intervene where in the past Maybe they wouldn't have felt like they needed to be personally responsible for something that was happening. Yeah, that's nice. There's no statute of limitation on the impact of an educational experience, which is really a nice idea for those of us who teach and don't always get that immediate feedback. Yeah? You have more of like a better ability to be proactive and change. Say it again? Like a more, um, or a better ability to become proactive in certain yeah, you can develop your voice because you're armed with the idea of examples of people who didn't and examples of people who did. Really, really good idea. Yeah. Anything else come to mind? I saw another hand over there somewhere. It reminds me, I don't know if you've seen, have you seen Courage to Care here? Oh, yes. Have they seen it no. in here? I can still only find it on VHS. I know, it's only in VHS, but that's, I, VHS? that's my <laughs> tragic flaw. <laughs> is that I can't use DVDs well. I have to have somebody that knows how to do it. Um, well, I, I highly recommend seeing this old film called Courage to Care. And I'll tell you why. Courage to Care was a, a series of six vignettes of people who were either saved or did the saving, rescuing, during the Holocaust in six different situations, six different settings. One of the stories, which I hesitate to say the word favorite, but it's the one that sticks with me the most. It's the one that I can put on and turn the sound down, and I can actually fill in the language, because I've seen it so many times and I know it so well. And it's the story of a woman named Marion Pritchard. Oh, uh, we have the same favorite. Uh, I know. Tell your story, then I'll tell mine. All right, I'll tell, you, I'll tell mine, then you tell yours. So Marion Pritchard uh, was a young Dutch Christian woman, 19 years old, going to the School of Social Work in Amsterdam, and she witnessed, uh, during the time of the Nazi occupation, she witnessed a Jewish orphanage, children being taken out of that orphanage and loaded onto a truck, to be taken to be sent off. And by then, uh, people, smart young people like Mary Pritchard had more than an inkling of what that meant. And she saw two elderly women come out with their parasols and hit the, the officers, the police, the Dutch police, and the German soldiers that were loading these children into the truck. And those two women were picked up and thrown bodily into the truck along with the children, and the truck 
disappeared and my friend whom I met many years ago, Marion Pritchard, and who's now on this video, uh, stepped behind a tree and thought to herself, oh my God, I'm powerless, I couldn't do a thing. And it was at that moment, it was at that very moment, that she made a decision that she was not going to be powerless. And she made a decision to move in the direction of becoming a rescuer her, herself. And eventually she did. She became a rescuer. She hid a family in the summer home that she and her parents had owned for many years. They had a, they had a, a basement room, they had a place that could be covered up. And there's a longer story than that that has to do with Courage to Care. But my important moment in this story is not what, what she does in that rescue. You can go find that on Courage to Care. You can see it if you check it out of a library or read the book about it. But, but for me, it's the turning point of having felt powerless in that moment and of making a determination that she wanted to be a certain kind of person. And that being that kind of person was going to create a change in her life that would last her a lifetime. She was the last I heard, and I don't know if she's still alive, but I think she is, a psychoanalyst living in Vermont. And so she's become a helping person in the later versions of her life, as, long as, as well as in those earlier eras uh, of, her, of her adolescence and her young adulthood. And I, I would dare to say that she was shaped by that moment as much as she was by all of the things she did to become a rescuer and find safe houses for Jews that were being hunted down by the Nazis in Holland. In that, in that period of time. So, you have a favorite. So I too, and my favorite is Marion Pritchard's story. And because it was an inspiring story, but because I had the great opportunity to actually have Marion Pritchard as one of my professors. So when I was at Clark, I took I'll a course down. called, <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> so yeah, I took, this is, this is like, you guys are an amazing opportunity. You're in a Holocaust and Genocide Studies program. You get this, great James Waller and all these fabulous uh, people coming through your door and to be into your classroom. And I, too, was fortunate enough to be in the right kind of program for who I was and what I wanted to study. One of them which was, I took a course called Rescue and Resistance during the Holocaust. Who better to be a professor than Marion Pritchard? So it was team taught with a professor named Deborah Dwork and Marion Pritchard, who was her mentor. And each week we read a book about different cases of rescue and resistance, maybe Sophie Schill's White Rose, at various other different stories, and we would sit around the table and Marion would tell us her analysis of it and we would share our ideas. And we're gonna come later to talking about eyewitnesses of the Holocaust and what the future is, but I'll tell you, I carry those seminars with me and the gift that I had to not only meet Marion Pritchard but to learn from her on a weekly basis, which is remarkable and definitely shaped a lot of, of where I am. So we have the same favorite. And, Jack and, and I agree We've known on a each other for years and I didn't know that, yeah. which is amazing to me. So, I met Mary she, Pritchard years ago, but I didn't know she had been a professor for Morgan, but that's amazing. Yeah, she is alive and well. Uh, I'm, so, I'm so glad to hear that. So I want to switch this up just a little bit, and I want to suggest to you that uh, in the work that I'm privileged to do at Facing History, uh, there, it takes a certain form. And it takes a form with the ideas in mind that you, some of you just articulated. We work with teachers primarily. We offer summer seminars. They're five days. They're about 50 hours over a period of five days. So it's like a semester long course. And it has a scope and sequence. And that scope and sequence of ideas that we give to teachers and that we take teachers through is rather like um, a semester course, but it's compacted. Uh, in a, in a, a workshoppy way, and then they spend eight, nine, ten hour days with us dealing with this history, developing curriculum around it, and trying to come to conclusions that would say, wow, how do we craft a class in which we, we make the opportunity for people to know something? We have to decide what's important. Is it important that young people know that Adolf Hitler came to power in 1933? Is that, is that something important? Is it important to know that anti-Semitism has a, has a history that goes well beyond what happened in the aftermath of World War I and the stab in the back theory? Is it important for young people to know that the Nuremberg Laws passed in 1935 had a certain weight, a certain impact, a certain trajectory in terms of what happens uh, in Germany at that time? And that, that that period of 33 to 38 in Germany in which half of Germany's Jews who made up less than 1% of the population of Germany at the time actually emigrate at that point, um, you know, or, or get out, and it doesn't mean they're all safe. You read Anne Frank, you know it didn't make them safe to leave Germany when they left in 1934. 
You know that when the Nazis invaded Holland in 1940, within a few years it was going to be dangerous for them to be there, as if it were as if the way it was dangerous for them to be German Jews. So the question is, what do young people need to know, deserve to know, have to carry in their minds as knowledge that they won't forget? How long do they have to remember it? Should they be able to pass a test when they're 50 years old about a timeline, geography, you know, um, the names of all the concentration camps? What is knowledge? How do you construct knowledge? What do you want them to walk away with? I found it really interesting that when we asked what makes for Holocaust education, what makes it effective, what were the things that were said? Were they about passing a test? Not really. They were about what kind of person you might become as a result of the process of sifting that information, of thinking about that information. But I would suggest that both matter, that the knowledge matters, that to be in communion with the academic world, with the knowledgeable world, there are things that you need to know that you should be held accountable for, that if you have children now or in the future, you should make sure they know. And so that body of knowledge we talk about in these seminars. I would suggest that there has to be an action part in a course. We have to be able to ask young people, what do you do with this information? And actually provide within the curriculum an opportunity for them to share information as a homework assignment. To find five people in their friendship circle who don't know this information and actually share it with them and bring back their comments on a three by five card. That's action. All right? So the what, the how, and the why are what we deal with at Facing History. We do five day seminars every summer and then we follow those teachers for the lengths of their careers. I was a facing history teacher. I started at Milpitas High School in 1978, 1978-79. By the time 1985 rolled around, I knew a little bit about facing history. I was trying to teach some Holocaust literature, like Anne Frank, without the help of a larger organization, without the inspiration of a Margot Strom, without the opportunity to have done internships, because they didn't exist for me. Uh, I went on my journey in a little bit of a different way. And so the organization that I now direct for the Bay Area uh, provides seminars, workshops throughout the school year, and most importantly, one-to-one -one coaching. My staff and I spend our days out in the field, in schools, observing classes, working with teachers, developing lesson plans, gathering curriculum, sifting it to match the needs of the teachers with whom we work, referring them to Morgan so they can figure out where they might like to get a Holocaust survivor to come and speak. On May 12th, we'll have two Holocaust survivors at American High School in Fremont. One will be a, a survivor of Auschwitz, and the other will be a hidden child. Two very different experiences. The children will meet them, there will be 300 children, young people, 10th graders, who meet these two survivors, but not in a vacuum. They will have had six weeks of intense Holocaust and human behavior study with teachers who've been through exacting programs and who know the history, who have had the chance to think hard about what makes for effective Holocaust education. And they won't just listen to the stories of those two survivors during the full day that they're there. They'll be asking them questions, and they'll be asking each other questions, and they'll be developing art projects that mean, what does this history mean to me? And then they'll be bringing in their parents at the end of the day so that they can stand next to their artwork and they can show and tell about what they've learned, not on that day or just from those survivors, but over the last six weeks and maybe over the last years of their curriculum in a thoughtful scope and sequence that involves a study of identity and the power of labels, a study of issues of membership and community, a study of the power of hard history to transform the way we think about the world, and a study of what it should mean to us in the way we go out and live our lives every day. That's that's what I think is an effective Holocaust curriculum. We don't do it in isolation. We do it with partners. They do their work with us. And we do it with our partners in the schools. So, sure. so a lot of times we get the question from people who don't really know the details of what we do, which is, there's this organization somewhere in the East Bay facing history and ourselves. What do they do? What do you do? Are we competing with each other? What's going on? And this is something that Jack and I sometimes get from people kind of outside of our inner circle who don't really understand. Yes, Holocaust intolerance education, teaching students 
respect in the world, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. One of the programs and the way we show the dance that we do, how we support each other, is the day of learning. So the mission of the Holocaust Center at JFCS is to support the Bay Area, Northern California, to support Holocaust and genocide education within the four walls of the classroom, which is providing curriculum consultation, like Jack says, doing teacher workshops often that we teach together, and also, most importantly, is to bring in survivors into the classroom. So we are really lucky to have a member of our speakers bureau here. Hans is here, and you guys had a chance to hear from him a few weeks ago. Hans is one of my teachers, and I've learned so much from him, and often we get to teach together, which is a lot of fun. And we make sure that when the survivor goes into the classroom that they are adequately prepared, that there's follow-up, that the survivor's needs are met, and that things like that go smoothly. But we also realize the logistical restrictions of what's going on in our California state schools, especially with the public schools, of how many hours within the school year that they can actually devote to Holocaust and genocide education. So we've also created programs outside of the four walls of the classroom. We have a program called The Next Chapter where we match up high school students with Holocaust survivors and they learn to take their oral histories and they take part in a weekly course. We have fellowships for high school students, soon to be fellowships for college students, stay tuned. And we have a program which is one of our signature programs which is called the Day of Learning. This past March we had 550 students and teachers come together on a Sunday, over 64 schools were represented, taking part in 14 different simultaneous workshops. So students like yourself, high school students as well, registered online, had a chance to choose from a variety of different workshops about rescue and resistance, about learning to be an upstander, about art and Holocaust and genocide, a variety of different ideas. And really what it's about is, is it's a self-selecting program. Those students don't have to be there. They choose on a Sunday to come from as far north as Ukiah, east in Roseville, south to the Central Valley, and they come on a Sunday to learn more. So the question of whether there's interest in this field, it's without a doubt. The question is, can we help and teach it effectively? So Facing History always teaches a workshop at the Day of Learning. I wouldn't do it without them. And that's just one of the examples of the programs that we do. We hand out something you guys can get afterwards, a program booklet. Because even though the Day of Learning is only one day, we hope that it sparks an interest and, and inspires the people that attend to learn more, to go home, to read up, to study, to ask people around them, what did you know? Were you witnesses? Asking grand grandparents, you were alive during World War II. What did you remember? What have you seen? And thinking about current genocide today or things that we've seen in the last few decades. So. We've been talking a lot about programs. I don't even know if you guys are really that interested in the details of our programs. Questions, thoughts on what we do inside and outside the classroom? So one of the, um, one of the things that I want to talk about, which actually is really relevant to you, is our library and archives. So at our facility, we have a library of over 12,000 volumes of books, mostly in English, but also in German, in Spanish, in Dutch, in French, in Yiddish, in Hebrew, and these resources are available to you. We also have a huge archives. What is, what's in the archives? Has anyone ever been in an archives before? What's a primary resource? Then I'll jump up at once. I think they're still suffering from Afternoon fatigue. Okay, spring, spring break, break. slowdown. Mm -hmm. Exactly, exactly. Has anyone ever seen primary resources, perhaps in a museum before? Has anyone ever been to the Holocaust Museum in Washington and seen a yellow star that people sewed up for their thing? Yeah, so that's a primary source. Has anyone ever seen? Um, a concentration camp uniform or a Nazi flag. Has anyone ever heard from a Holocaust survivor? Those are all primary sources, exactly. So in our archives, we actually don't have Holocaust survivors in our archives, but we do have oral histories and we have um, many different items. So I encourage you, as, as you're doing your own research, as you think about going to graduate school, we're a resource for you and our catalog if you're able to search online, see what we've got, and we would love you to come visit, do research, check out our archives, there's some very cool things to see. So I think we're going to transition yeah, to the question. note cards. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So you guys all have a note card, right? We've been talking too long. Yeah, so you're going to be talking to each other for a few minutes. 
Um, and you're going to be developing some stuff that we'll use in the last part of the program tonight um, that is a way of getting your questions out uh, without having to help you stand up in the very back of the room because we'll have the cards. But we don't necessarily want you to do these alone or in isolation unless you choose to. Um, you can work with these on these with a partner or two. And uh, here's the idea. Um, if I were in your situation, I'd have questions about Holocaust education. And I'd have questions about the history or about how it's taught or about anything that you've heard us say. And uh, your job, either alone or with a partner, is to write down one or more questions on your card. And we're going to give you a few minutes to do that. This should not be quiet time. You do not have to stay glued to your seat. Uh, you might be able to get a stretch at the same time, which serves your kinesthetic needs as well. And um, that's a good thing. So uh, we're going to give you about three, maybe what, three or four minutes? Yeah. Three or four minutes to gather some questions, and then we'll collect your cards. You don't have to put your names on them, but, you know, if you want to, you can. Every year when I stand in front of the horse, I get a wall. George Heller isn't there, but I tell that story. And I've become a storyteller of George's story, of Hans's story, of many different stories. Not to replace them, but only to include that story when they're not there themselves. And so one program we run, which is the Manival Holocaust History Fellowship, and where eight students, high school students, study with me for um, a, almost a semester and a half, is for them to learn how to be storytellers in many different ways, in ways that make sense mostly to you. So we're going to watch a little clip from one of the projects that the Manival Fellows did, and um, just to get an idea of one of the methods, and one of the options, and one of the things we hope will not replace the survivors, but encourage storytelling and education beyond the eyewitness era. So will you guys stand up for the movie? We're going, to, we're going to address these by email to Nina, yeah. okay. and she can give them back. We're going to actually write answers to all these questions and send them to you. 